today we have Ernest Johnson. He's kicking this off, and um, I just want to turn this over to Ernest and and thank Ernest for for being a part of Flyer for for many years now, and hopefully many more to come. Thank you, Ernest. Hi, I'm Ernest Johnson, uh, Executive Vice President of Apex One Investment Partners. I think I've uh, met many of you at meetings and events we've had. Michael, thank you for allowing us the time uh, to speak to your uh, uh, constituents today. Uh, as I mentioned, Apex One Investment Partners, we're a private equity firm that invests exclusively in multifamily or apartment communities throughout the United States. Uh, we just closed our fourth fund and we'll be launching our fifth fund uh, sometime in the next 30 to 45 days. What I'd like to talk about today, <clears throat> we can go through the agenda, uh, Jeremy, you can switch there, um, is a look at the nation's housing shortage, what we call a slow creep to crisis. In other words, how did we get in this position where we have so few housing and such great demand? Uh, our history of managing through the challenges we've seen the last three years with the pandemic and, and now the economic concerns that are present in the market. And then just very briefly talking on our fifth fund, Apex One Multifamily Strategic Investors Fund 5. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. So this is our team. Uh, we're a relatively small uh, group. We have 13 people that work at Apex One. Uh, we do not manage our own properties. We simply manage investments. Uh, we like to be that point of the sword of penetration. Uh, we, allow, we think it allows us to be more flexible and work without conflicts of interest with our investors. Uh, the next slide shows our history. Uh, we've been around 11 years now. Seems like a, it was a pretty quick run. Uh, there you can see our accomplishments with our funds we've raised, but two things I'd point out, uh, the purple uh, letters in the, above the timeline back in 2016, uh, we're proud that we were the second group designated uh, under <clears throat> Freddie Mac to earn their green up designation for the work we were doing in our communities uh, to reduce utilities and energy consumption. Uh, they actually gave us a break on our loans of 20 to 50 basis points on our spread which allowed us to uh, enter what we call it a win-win-win situation. Uh, it was certainly a win for our residents as we could lower their consumption cost uh, for their appliances and utilities in their apartments. It was a win for our investors, the lower interest rates uh, generated higher returns. And of course, it was a win for the environment as we lowered our uh, <clears throat> footprint uh, on the communities. And then in January, 2018, we were named a select sponsor by Freddie Mac. Uh, we're one of 60 to hold that designation out of the thousands of people that borrow from Freddie Mac. Uh, basically, what that does is they assign a full-time team to our organization to handle all of our loan requirements, which allows us to close much quicker. It gives sellers uh, a certainty that we are going to close. And as a select sponsor, we receive another 20 to 50 basis point uh, break on our loans that we generate through Freddie Mac. So we're proud of those two accomplishments. Uh, <clears throat> the next slide. So let's jump into what we want to talk about today, the, the nation's housing shortage. Go ahead, Jeremy. <clears throat> so how severe is the shortage and, and, and how did this happen? That's, that's the question people ask me. How do we get here? And you, you see the news all the time and they talk about this housing shortage. But today we're going to put it in numbers and kind of give you some perspective because I think people are going to be shocked when they see how, how severe this is and, and how it's happened. <clears throat> so if you go back to 1968, and we use those years ago, that's when we really started measuring housing and real estate numbers in, in our markets. So from 1968 to 2000, that 32 year period, the nation's housing stock grew by 1.7% per year. And that includes both apartments and, and, and single family homes. So whatever the inventory of that totality was the year before, it would grow on average 1.7% until 2000. Between 2000 and 2020 and 2020, it averaged 1% growth. So we had a significant decrease. If you break that down further, after the Great Recession of 2008, from that period of 2010 to 2020, our housing stock only grew 7% a year. So this wasn't uh, you know, just in major markets. This was literally all throughout the United States. There's this decrease in housing stock, decrease in construction. And so what happened is if you take that time from 2000 until 2020, when, this, when these drops first started occurring, we've underbuilt by 5.5 million housing units. And if you look at the total 
housing deficit in the country, it would be about 6.8 million units because there was a shortage before, obviously. So we're in a situation right now, next slide, Michael, I'm Jeremy, <laughs> of, of where we're 6.8 million housing units short. But to me, this is the picture that the, the green line on the left, starting on the left from 1968 and going up, that's the population growth. So we've gone from a country of about 200 million people in 1968 to almost 340 million people in 2020. That blue line represents what's been going on in housing. So you can see where the, the natural disaster is occurring. Our population is growing and our housing stock is shrinking. And an interesting part about this, you know, when you look at that big drop starting in 2000, that the drop, the decline actually started before. From 1968 until the mid to late 70s, maybe hitting right into 1980, our country built about 450 to 475,000. That's 450 to 475,000 starter homes, homes that were available and affordable to firemen, policemen, nurses, teachers, managers of retail stores. This was their starter home to begin the, the climb into the American dream. We were building 450 to 475,000. In 2019, the country built 65,000 starter homes. And that wasn't because of COVID or anything else. It's just that there's no profit in those starter homes anymore. And it's just been severely underbuilt. And so I believe that's what you're seeing is that drop is we're just no longer bringing the supply of starter homes into the, into the market. And instead builders are tend to focus more on luxury housing, which is why we're seeing the surge in housing, both in single family and in, in multifamily. Next slide. So, so let's look at the, the single family housing shortage first. So th this to me, when I saw the statistic a couple of weeks ago, is just a staggering uh, evaluation. If you look in our country at any given time on any given day, back in from 2019 and before, there were roughly 1.2 million homes listed for sale. Every day, day in, day out, 1.2 million homes listed for sale throughout the United States on any given day. On February 28th of 2022, that number had dropped to 338,000 homes listed for sale, a 71% decrease. The next slide shows how that's impacted Florida, one of the most active markets in the country. And again, we're looking at the major markets here. I'm not talking about Quincy, Florida, where my family grew up, uh, little communities like that. These are the major markets where people move to in Florida. On any given day, there were 110,000 homes for sale. That's homes and condominiums. On February 28th, there were 27,000 homes listed for sale. Next slide shows North and South Carolina. It's a popular stopping point for our friends from New York coming down to Florida. Any given day in North and South Carolina, 53,000 homes for sale. February 28th, 2022, 10,800 homes for sale. So as you look at these numbers, you begin to realize that this isn't a quick fix. Homes don't come out of you know, nowhere to, 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 to suddenly be available. <clears throat> Hit the next slide, please. So just kind of in a snapshot, in February of 2022, 338,000 homes for sale. Average listings any other time is about 1.2 million. To get us to equilibrium, and equilibrium in the single family home market is considered six months of supply. That's what is believed for the buyer and seller has equal negotiating position when there's a six month supply of homes on the market. We would need 2 million homes brought onto the market to get back to equilibrium. And that's a staggering number of listings when 1.3 million was the average number that would happen at any given time. The next slide, please. So one, you know, everybody said, well, let's just start building more houses. And here you see this, this activity, the frenzy of construction, and you know, leading up to the great economic crash of, of 2006, 2008. Uh, you remember that was the period of time when if you could fog a mirror, you could get a home loan for about 105 to 107% of what you paid for it. So look at all the construction that was going on as this, everybody was trying to supply homes into this market. You know, one word of warning, be careful about buying a home built during that period of time because they were built fast. And I'm not sure about the quality of construction, but suddenly construction goes down. We have hardly any construction going on for a number of years. And now we're just now ticking back up to that 1 million. And keep in mind, this is gross deliveries. This doesn't include the two to 300,000 homes a year that are lost to demolition, to fire, hurricanes, floods, you name it. This is just new home deliveries. It's not the net deliveries. Uh, let's hit the next slide, Michael. <clears throat> so we won't go into all these, but I, I bring these up because everybody's like, well, how does that affect my hometown? 
And these are the top 25 metropolitan statistical areas in the country. And look at the very the one on the very top, Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater. That, if you have time today, go to Google Map, Google Earth, and zoom out and look at this from the sky, from a satellite image, and look at how large this metroplex is. There are 3,016 homes listed for sale in that sprawling metropolitan area on February 28th of this year. If you go to the far right, well, you, you see that's down 82% from 2019. If you go to the right-hand side, this is sort of an interesting comparison. Typically, in February of, two, of 2019, there were 5.1 homes listed for sale for every 1,000 people in that market. Today, there's 0.9 homes listed for sale. That's, a, that's the 82% decrease in listings. Um, and, and Jeremy, if we just kind of flip through the next page, uh, you know, here's the top 26 to 50 markets. Raleigh, North Carolina, one of the greatest places to live, a super hot market, 666 homes listed for sale. That's down 86% from 2019. Uh, go to the next page. Uh, you know, even little, what used to be sleepy little communities like North Sarasota, Bradenton, Florida. Uh, it used to have 10.8 homes listed for every 1,000 people. Now it's down to 1.3, a decrease of 88%. So this isn't occurring in just certain markets. It's not because everybody's moving to South Florida. This is occurring all over the country. And this just shows the severity of our uh, situation. Let's look at the next page real quick. So this is employment changes and available homes for sale. And this is where we're going to transition into multifamily here because employment change is one of the drivers that we look for. Uh, when, when there's great and tremendous and strong job growth in, 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 our, in, in the U.S., we tend to have very strong uh, multifamily demand. So if you look through these, these markets, uh, and by the state, the different colors, uh, uh, the, the cities marked in red, are in Republican-led legislatures and governors, and those that are in blue are Democratic-led uh, governors and legislatures. Uh, Austin, Round Rock, Texas, uh, just a tremendous success story. Uh, there's a lot going on in Austin. We've all heard of this guy, Elon Musk, and this little car company he has called Tesla. And of course, you remember early on, uh, Mr. Musk moved his foundation to Austin, Texas. He decided he liked it so much, and more importantly, they really liked him. He moves Tesla's headquarters uh, in big manufacturing plants. You've seen the price of industrial properties just skyrocket. A uh, group of investors led by Elon Musk has been out buying single family homes throughout that market to give his employees a place to live. Uh, it's just tremendous job growth there. Uh, Facebook, uh, under the new name Meta, they've moved to Austin, Texas, or in the process of moving. They've leased about 700,000 square feet downtown. That would be a you know, as I sit here in Miami, Florida, that would be about as big as any major downtown high rise. They literally are moving that many jobs to Austin, Texas. Um, word this morning, certainly the rumors is uh, Elon may be thinking about what the, uh, the, the future home of uh, Twitter might be. Uh, Texas, Florida, both pushing, trying to recruit that location. Uh, but he certainly has a strong card to play there. So Austin, Texas, just tremendous job growth. But homes, there's 78% fewer homes than we saw in February of 2019. It's sort of interesting just to talk about that one outlier you see up in the, the top job growth area, and, and that's the, uh, the interior part of, of California, Riverside, San Bernardino, Ontario, California. What you're seeing there is jobs moving from some of the coastal parts of California uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, energy costs have gone up tremendously in, in California. If, if y'all are any of you are, are in California listening to this, you know the price at the pump is six dollars plus. Uh, you sit in traffic, you burn a lot of fuel. It's very frustrating to have to spend that amount of time going to your job, and so a lot of companies are doing their expansions and relocations into this 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 inner part of the state, and so you're seeing some migration out of some of the coastal areas into these in, into this market. Uh, Dallas Fort Worth again, Texas is a very tax friendly uh, state, seeing tremendous job growth. And they're rounding out the top five, two tremendous uh, Florida markets, Jacksonville, and there again, that Tampa, St. Petersburg, Clearwater, Florida market. You know, again, just you know, what we're seeing over the last few years during the pandemic is a, a, a lot of large employers in the New York areas, especially the financial markets that for years said, we've got to be in New York. This is where we have to be. More and more of their executive had homes in Florida, 
They moved down here during the pandemic and said, you know, we really don't want to go back. And if any of y'all have seen the traffic in Miami in the last few uh, few years, you know, it's grown uh, and it doesn't recede when it gets uh, you know, warm down during during the summer months. Everybody's, it's not just a winter retreat anymore. It's, it's becoming a 24, a 12, 24 city. Um, so you see that growth. And then you're seeing some of the financial firms begin to move divisions, some significant divisions of their corporations down to the Florida markets. And they're loving Jacksonville because it's a relatively inexpensive uh, market within Florida compared to some of the South Florida markets. And then there's been a tremendous move over towards the Clearwater St. Tampa, especially in the financial services group, uh, Raymond James and others that have just continued to grow over there. But what's been also interesting about Florida that we've studied is the migration to South Florida, uh, especially the Southwest coast, where you've seen a lot of technology firms locate down there. And the reason for that is, you know, pretty good school systems. And if you're a young family, you know, raising children, you wanna be somewhere where your kids have a chance to have a great education. Uh, it's still a relatively inexpensive place to live. Uh, they, they've got great healthcare systems down there. You know, er, everybody had a, a grandfather, a grandmother, an aunt or uncle that lived in South Florida and you'd go down. Well, the healthcare industry knew years ago, we had to have good healthcare systems in place there. And of course, in, the, in, a, in a post COVID world, we're all concerned about health. So that serves as an attraction. Florida doesn't get a lot of credit for it, but they've certainly been one of the leaders in, in, in greening up and being very efficient, recycling and things like this. And that's what these young families are looking for as well. So. So all the ingredients were there for these technology firms to locate to a great location, what used to be sleepy towns like Fort Myers, and now they're thriving technology centers. And so we think we'll continue to see that as well. So let's shift over now and talk about multifamily and, and what this means. So as we look at the, the multifamily home shortage, again, some of these numbers are just staggering to people who have been in this business for a while. And the numbers I'm talking about that I'm going to show you today, I'm primarily excluding, uh, exclusively excluding affordable housing. Affordable housing stays full. Uh, apartments that are renting to people making less than $40,000 a year, there's a waiting list to get them, especially the good ones. So we just take those out because we've always thought it distorts the figures a little bit. So these are the A and B apartments, institutional grade apartments, large apartment complexes that we're talking about. So our current vacancy is 2.4%. We are 97.6% occupied in the apartment industry. And, and I can tell you, our apartments, I was just running the numbers for our quarterly report, and we're running about 98.7%. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty much across the industry. Historically, our vacancy has been 7%, or we've been 93% occupied. So here's what happens in our world. It's pretty simple. Once we hit 93% occupancy in the market, the developers start cranking the engines back up and start bringing new product into the market. It takes about two years to deliver that product. They start, you know, by that time, the oxygen is maybe up to 94%, 95%. People start moving out of those highly occupied apartments. They get some incentives, a month of free rent, you know, discounted cable bill, uh, you know, whatever. And they start moving to these brand new apartments. Eventually, we settle down to about 91 to 92% occupancy. Naturally, we start filling back up to 83, and the cycle starts again. So we've always hovered between 93 and 95%. We underwrite our properties to 93 to 95% occupancy. That's what the lenders want you to do. No one underwrites to 97% occupancy. So here we are. We're 97.6% we're occupied nationwide in Class A luxury apartments. So... Why don't we just build more? Well, it's, it, it's not that easy. Um, material costs are up. Uh, there's a scarcity of land in terms of where you want to build these projects so that people have access to schools, to retail, to different communities, their offices, et cetera. So we've historically built, uh, now we're looking at the green bars on the right side. We, we've historically built about 325 to 350,000 gross units a year. Now, again, we lose about 75 to 100,000 apartment units because we tear them down to build new ones. They burn down or they just become flat obsolete. They, they're, they're just, or they go down into the affordable housing category. So that means we really build, you know, bring out about 275,000 units on, on any you know, good year. This year, completions in 2022 are projected to be about 425,000 gross units. And the reason we're having a surge isn't because we saw this big demand. It was all these pro projects 
that were pigeonholed during COVID. Uh, I, I don't know if any of y'all tried to get anything done with a city or a county during COVID, but they were just shut down. They had minimal staff. People weren't working. You, you just could not go in and push something through. So a lot of these projects have just slowed down. There was the delivery of supplies that had slowed down. There was labor issues that slowed down. So this is just the projects that were on a slow pace during COVID are now accelerating and coming to the market. And that's why we're seeing a higher delivery. But you may ask, well, how many units would it take to get back to 7% vacancy? We would need 2 million units delivered this year to get back to 7% vacancy. We have never come close to delivering two, we've never come close to delivering a million units in a year. I, I think our best year ever was around the 500,000 unit mark. So, uh, you know, it, it, it just isn't going to happen overnight. So as a result of this, let's go to the next slide, Jeremy. <clears throat> Everybody's been hearing about the rent growth and what's going on. So the, these are some actual numbers. Uh, sitting here in Miami, uh, leader of the pack, uh, rent growth year over year. So from this time last year till today, rents in Miami are up 52.4%. I've told this story to several of y'all, but I, I remember sitting in Miami. Uh, I, I was at a hotel right down the street on Brickell. And I think I was talking to Michael Corselli and I said, you guys need to buy some stuff in Miami. It's a great market. It's booming. It's coming back. Well, Two years ago, pre-COVID, this market was so overbuilt, and I'm sitting there staring at a high-rise apartment complex, and you can just tell when a building's dead. It, it, there was no one there. You know, it's Miami, Florida, and there's five people by the pool. That, that tells you there's something going on right there. And there's this big banner draped down. It said, you know, call us for leasing, ask about free rent. You, you couldn't give apartments away. And now, oxygen is so high. Rents are up 52%. I was, I was at a meeting here in Florida a couple of weeks ago. And by the way, I should have listened to Michael. We should have bought some of those apartments in Miami a couple of years ago. So a smart guy, Michael is. Anyway, I, I was having a meeting with, we we're reviewing our fund five uh, thesis with some of our current investors to get their feedback. And I'm going through some of these charts. And, and one of the gentlemen in the meeting, one of our investors said, I, you know, my son told me this interesting story that I wasn't sure I believed until I saw this chart. Uh, one of his buddies, one of his best friends had rented an apartment downtown Miami overlooking the water, beautiful two bedroom apartment was paying $3,500 a month. Now that, that seems like a lot to me, $3,500 a month for an apartment. He got his 60 day notice. We, we let our residents know 60 days before their lease expires that if you want to renew, here's what your rent's going to be. Now this wasn't our apartment. He gets his renewal notice and they tell him his rent is going from 3,500 to 9,600 a month. And they tell him there's no negotiating because we have a waiting list for this apartment and, and the guy moves out. So, you know, it, it's happening. But it's also interesting that if you look at these top four markets for rent growth, they're in Florida. And this is not from this is from the U.S. Census Bureau and the National Multifamily Housing Council. This is not from the Florida Real Estate Promotion Bureau. The top four markets in this country are in Florida. A another interesting point about this chart is eight of the 10 fastest growing markets for rent are all in states with no income tax. Again, think about what drives apartments, job growth. Think about what's very attractive to a company relocating somewhere, no state income tax. This isn't coincidental, and I think we're gonna to continue to see this. One of the markets that, you know, again, there's Austin at number six, you know, doing well, but one of the markets that is really interesting on, on this list that you, I've never seen on any top 10 list in my life was Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis is a town that I don't think has ever seen $1,000 average rent. It, it's a relatively low income market. It's also one of the most affordable markets in the United States. It's always, always ranks way up there in terms of low housing prices that so a lot of people can afford to buy a house. The problem in Memphis is there's no homes for sale. The other problem in Memphis, you've got some big economic drivers there like FedEx that, plays a, that pays a very fair wage to their, employers, to their employees. Other employees in the area, because it's a good place to work and Tennessee is a tax-free state, have pushed wages up. So people are making a little more money. They can't find a home to buy, or if they find it, they may not have a down payment or they may not qualify under the tighter lending requirements. And so they want to rent a place and they want to rent a place where there's good schools. We have two apartment projects in Memphis, Tennessee. We paid about $78 million for the both of them. Uh, we currently have them uh, under an agreement to sell for $150 million. 
And the reason is they're in one of the top school districts in the state of Tennessee. And when people make more money, the first thing they want to do is let's take care of our kids. Let's get them into a good school zone. If we've got to pay a little more to rent, that's what we're going to do. And it's going to be a nice community. It's going to be near where I work. We're, one of our properties is like you know, 10 minutes from FedEx's headquarters. So in about 25 minutes, 20 minutes from their World Technology Center. So again, this is what happened. So again, it was really interesting to see Memphis on that, that list. The rest of them are, are pretty much uh, same old, same old. Let's go to the next slide. So th 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 this is, we're just doing a little deeper dive on our, on our industry and, and, and what's going on with it. So th this is a fascinating chart to me. Uh, I, I actually like numbers. My, my background's in accounting, so I, I just like numbers. They, they tend not to lie. We can make them lie, but they tend not to. So this is real interesting. So if you look at this, what I want you to focus on is the blue. Well, let, let's, let's, let's take a step back. So this starts on February 1st, 2020. Well, that's kind of when everybody realized this thing called COVID was beginning to happen. We were watching the charts. It was coming out of China, wherever, and it was growing. So we get later into the year, you end about April or May, we have our lockdown, and all of a sudden, apartments can't get anybody to come look at their vacant units because no one wants to get out of the house. And we were shut down. We were told we couldn't come to the office. So how do you look at an apartment if you can't show it to somebody? Well, there's some really creative things that happened later in the pandemic, virtual showings, everything was done online. I could unlock my apartment electronically. You could walk in and look at a unit. I had these cameras. I could watch you walk. I could talk to you. We could do a lease electronically. I never met you. And all of a sudden you're moving into an apartment if you can find movers to move you. But it was slow. And so, you know, again, our natural reaction when everything slows down is to what? Lower the price. Let's get them in here. Let's, let's make it so cheap they can't afford not to move in. So that's what you saw. You saw the decline in pricing. Uh, and, and the hardest apartments typically to rent are studio apartments. Now, again, think about what's happening. So we're in this pandemic. Work from home is emerging. Young people have jobs. They've got an office. I, you know, no one wants to be able to see their office and their bed and their dining area from the same location. It, it, and that's what a studio gives you. Everything is in one location. You have no break. One bedroom is better, and there's a big demand for two bedrooms. So look at that chart. The two bedroom is the red. You can see rent start escalating dramatically as we start to work from home on a regular basis. I want my, I want my, my bedroom, and then I want my office space. I want them separate. So then you start running out of two bedrooms. And people are moving to Florida, they're moving to Austin, and they call us, they want a two bedroom. We don't have any two bedrooms. Okay, well, I'll take a one bedroom. So we lease up our one bedrooms, and then guess what's left? <laughs> All I have is a studio renter. I'll take it. So look at the pricing on studios dramatically increases, and now it's the highest increase of any of the apartments that we've had because there is so much demand. We have two to three percent vacancy. We have some apartments. We, we have several apartments that in, in our portfolio that are 100 percent leased. There's just a waiting list to get in. People will take whatever is available. If I'm moving to Florida and I'm going to bring my family down eventually, I may have to take that studio for now and then I'll take the two bedroom when it opens up. But this to me just is a real interesting snapshot of how much demand there is for multifamily that people will pay these premium prices for studio apartments. The next slide just digs a little more into what's going on with rent. So the, the yellow line is the median rent. That is the, the dollar value that you see on the right-hand side. And so you can see back in 2020, our average rent was a tick under $1,450. It was about $1,425 was the average rent throughout the country. Today, the average rent is almost $1,800. It actually is a hair over $1,800. That's where we are. In two years, we've gone from 1,425 to 1,800. Look at the percentage increase. The blue line shows the year over year. So there's that number you keep hearing about that rents are up 18% just since last year. A, a shocking number. And as you'll hear later in single family housing, it, it, it's up even more. It's just the rent growth and demand is it's it's economics 101, supply and demand. There is a huge demand. And you know, as we've talked about our growth in population, you know, we haven't even talked about some other variables that impact population. Um, we have, you know, I think we're taking 100 uh, you know, people from Ukraine you know, that need a place to live. 
we have a, a border that's, you know, regardless of your political side, there, there are people coming across the border and they're going to need a place to live. Uh, and the last number I saw was about 2 million people came over the border last year. So, you know, let's say there's between 2.3 and 2.5 million people that migrate into this country looking and they, they are looking for work not to mention just the in the ongoing birth rates uh, that we have in the United States that increases the population. So you know, there, there's just a lot going on. Um, the next slide, <clears throat> we, we talked about rent overall and the, the properties we have are class A properties in our last fund and in the current fund we're coming out with. So he, here's what the phenomena that we're seeing. And, and when you think about it, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, rent growth, <clears throat> well, let me just kind of go back and speak personally. So I lived in Los Angeles. I moved out there in the late 1980s, um, lived there through the late 90s. I moved from Atlanta, Georgia. I'd owned a house. I'd owned a house everywhere I'd lived prior to that. I moved to Los Angeles. I go looking for a house. I find this bungalow built in 1935. It was about a thousand square feet, including a garage. You couldn't get a car in. And they wanted $1.2 million for it in Westwood. So that, that wasn't happening, so I became a renter. So I noticed a lot of my friends that I made in Los Angeles, they drove Porsches, Mercedes, really nice cars, and they rented. And I, and I, I couldn't figure out, why would you have that nice a car? You know, shouldn't you own a home? And so, again, California, whether we like it or not, is, is one of our bellwether states. And so I think what you're seeing, you know, what you saw out there was people said, you know, I can't afford a home. I can't afford to buy a home in, in a place where I want to be. So I'm going to rent a pretty nice place and drive a nice car. And I think we're beginning to see that around in other places of the country. If people can't afford a home, they're going to rent a very nice home. So it used to be in our class A apartments that the typical income we saw was you know, seventy dollars to $90,000. That, that was a good income. You could afford our apartments, no affordability issue. Now, as we look at our properties in Fort Myers, in Jacksonville, in Orlando, uh, even in Louisiana, suddenly the average income of the people living in our apartments is about 120 to 150,000 a year. Uh, again, a little side note that I thought thinks interesting: uh, when we bought our property in Fort Myers, Florida, uh, we go through the rent rolls and look at people's credit to make you know just randomly check it. And we saw a number of residents in our apartments that were making 110, 120,000 a year. And they had five and six hundred thousand dollars in their bank account or of, of assets. And we're like, well, wait a minute, why aren't you buying a house? And so what we found out is a lot of these people, because of this hot housing market, they bought their home for maybe two hundred thousand dollars a couple of years ago. And all of a sudden it's worth five or six hundred thousand dollars. They go, when am I ever going to make this kind of money? I'm going to sell it take some chips off the table. I'm going to rent a really nice apartment near my office or near where my kids go to school. Our two and three bedrooms are in super high demand. And so that's the changing makeup of our residents is as people that are making a little more money, which means they can afford higher rent. So again, if you look at what the class A rent increases have done, have been tremendous. Now we're, this starts from Witten Advisors, by the way. And you can see, we think there's going to be a tapering off um, we always assume there's a tapering off. We never assume there's this kind of rent growth. We always assume there's going to be a tapering off. So I think this is a conservative look at the outlook. But what we're really trying to show here is we think there's some margin of safety, um, some long-term intrinsic value in Class A properties because they're more resilient to uh, rent increases. The residents can't afford to pay it. Their alternative to go out and buy something as nice just really doesn't exist. And I don't know if any of y'all have been in any Class A apartments lately, but the amenities that you'll see in these apartments are just extraordinary. You have to really think about, am I going to move from a place that has a 10,000 square foot workout room, that has two pools, that has outdoor cabanas with television, it has a speakeasy bar where I can set up a uh, you know, event with my friends. It has cooking grills. I've got uh, you, know, you know, gas stoves in my apartment. I've got a private garage. I've got a charger for my EV vehicle. You have to go, am I really going to move away, away from this? This is a pretty good you know, resort style life I have right now. So let's go to the next slide. So when we, when we look at both the single family homes and the multifamily homes, we go, okay, what does this really mean? Where are we? Well, as I mentioned earlier, there's a 6.8 million unit housing deficiency in our country. On average, we build about 
13 to 1400 apartments and single family homes every year. So if we wanted to get both of those back to equilibrium, or another way to think of it, if we wanted to give everybody a home that would like to have a place to live, be it an apartment, we would have to deliver 20 million units over the next 10 years. And that takes into account death rates, birth rates, immigration, all these things. We would need 20 million homes in 10 years, and it has never been done before. Even back when we were building 475,000 starter homes a year, we've never come close to hitting this average of 20 million homes over the next 10 years. And so, you know, I've talked to some people, I say, well, you know, it, it's, it's going to change. More homes will come up for sale. People will move different things. I, 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 I don't know if that's the case. Another very interesting phenomena that's going on in, in, in the housing industry right now, uh, and when I say housing, I, I mean both single family homes and apartments, is the advent of, of cash buyers. And by that, I mean the, the funds that are out raising large pools of money to go out and buy single family homes and, and, and turn them into rental properties. The single family rental industry has, has done tremendousness. It's, it's a great product. Um, you know, the family that can't afford a down payment on a home um, that maybe doesn't qualify for a lease, but they want to be, you know, they want a yard for the kids, et cetera. They want to be in a good school district. Um, they're perfectly willing to rent a home, a house. It, it's a great solution for them if they want to get out of the apartment type life. So here, here's an interesting number. So back in 2020, um, the amount of capital that was out chasing single family rentals was about $4 billion. That's a big number, $4 billion out chasing single family rentals. Today, as of February, there's $50 billion out chasing single family rental properties. And that can be build to rent, that can be single family rentals. To put that number into perspective, remember when I said earlier, there's 330,000 homes listed for sale in the United States right now. If you took that 50 million, and let's say the average home price was $400,000, that'd take $125,000 out of the market. The other thing to look at with that money is <clears throat> you've heard of bidding wars and people just, you know, they, gosh, 24 people bid on my house. I've bid on 10 houses. I've never made one. So let's think about this if you're a seller. You know, if, 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 if Michael Corselli has a home for sale and Ernest Johnson, home buyer, you know, wants to come up and buy his house. And, you know, we talked to his wife, who's a really good realtor. And, you know, we, we make our offer and you know, it's a good offer. We, you know, let's get aggressive. Let's pay 5,000 more over asking price. And, and you know, we, we need some time to do due diligence on the house. We need inspections. We want to check the roof because it's Florida. And, you know, then we've got to you know, get our loan in place. I'm pre-qualified, but I've still got to go through underwriting. So I'm, I'm going to need about 45 days, you know, to have to closing. And, and here's my offer. And I think it's a good offer and we're happy with it. Well, a few minutes, Jeremy walks in who represents, you know, a company from Blackstone. And Jeremy looks at the house, walks in and says, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you $10,000 over list price and I'll close in seven days. No inspections, no nothing. What do you want to do? I'm taking Jeremy's offer all day long if I'm Michael. And that's what's happening in the single family sector right now. This, you know, the, the, the cash buyers are coming in, securing these homes, making offers that are hard for, uh, you know, a, a seller to resist and close quickly because they really don't care about the condition because they have the cash, they can fix it up. They're not worried. They've run their algorithms. They know how much they have to spend and fix it up. So that's why there's fewer and fewer listings and fewer homes available, or at least you know, one factor contributing to it. And then again, the, the rising cost of construction. <clears throat> and I think the other thing that we have to look at in, in, in this overall picture is, is what's going on in the world. And, and again, this is not a, a political commentary. It's just a fact. Um, there is you know, the, the, the photos from Ukraine, I, I, don't, I don't know about y'all, but, but to me, they're just staggering. I, I never thought in my lifetime I would see a modern European country bombed. I, I, you know, we, we, we all saw in school the pictures of what happened in, in Germany, uh, the, the, the destruction in Japan, you know, modern countries for the time that just suffered tremendous damage. And, and we just think we would ever see that again. You know, may, maybe in some countries it, it, it just happens. But when you think about modern countries, you just thought you would never see this. And, you know, while there's been a lot of death, a lot of those people have relocated. They fled to Poland. Uh, we're taking about 85 to 100,000 here in the U.S. Other countries are opening their doors. And so then the question is, you know, there's two questions. One, where are they going to live? So a lot moved to Poland. Poland's got a tight housing market. Someone's got to build houses and apartments and, and high-rise buildings and house people. And that guess what? The stove I use in the U.S. 
is about the same stove they're using over there. So now I've got more demand. The wood that I'm using, same wood over there, the concrete materials, all those uh, you know, oil-driven products that it takes to build is being used over there as well. We've got a tightening market because of tense relations with China in terms of getting products out. Um, you know, I, I think there's probably been a loss of about 500,000 homes, and I, I haven't seen that number. I'm just looking at pictures, and you're looking at the displacement and the population centers that are being bombed. So it's not just a matter of us going and taking all the supplies in the world and, and, and solving our housing problem in the United States. There's a worldwide housing crisis, not just here. And so, you know, what, what I think this means, we were talking about this this morning, is I think what you're going to see is really a, a lot of Americans and a lot of residents in the U.S. rethinking about what their housing goals are. Uh, is the American dream to buy an older home and fix stuff if you can't afford it? You know, you just can't afford it. I think we're going to see more and more of what we're seeing in Europe and a lot of other countries around the world where people are living in, in, in multifamily or high-rise condos. Uh, it's certainly a better use of land and, and some resources. And so, I, again, I just think we're going to continue to see this shift uh, as, as more and more people are just going to have to decide they're, they're going to live in, in, in something besides single-family housing uh, unless they can find the rental opportunities through some of the providers or, or have the means to go out. Now, again, this is a tale of two cities. Um, there are all the luxury homes you want to buy out there. But if you're looking at something under four or $500,000, it is a tight, tight, tight market. And that's where the apartment communities come into play. So just to touch on a couple of things real quick uh, as we move through time, let's go to the next slide. So this is what I call our managing through challenges. So back and hit the next slide, Jeremy, if you would. So back in our annual investment meeting in 2020, the beginning of COVID, our, we, we had a little theme. It was Houston, we have a problem. And if you remember... Uh, Apollo 13, we had the explosion in space, and NASA pulled their brightest minds together and said, this is all they have on that capsule. This is it. We can't send anything else up. We've got to get them home, and we want to get them home alive, and these are all the tools they have to work with. We had to have a plan. Um, so, you know, we looked at our situation. Uh, next slide, Jeremy. And, you know, we were looking at our situation. You know, we, had, we had no idea back then if people were going to pay rent. We, we had no idea what was going to happen. And so we had to put together a new plan. And, and, and part of our plan was really empowering our property managers to make decisions. We let people pay weekly. We let people pay you know, every other week. Uh, we let our managers make a decision. If somebody was a month or two late, but they knew the person and they knew they were going to be good for that money, we'd say, fine, have them send a note. Uh, ourselves and Balfour Beatty started a small fund to help with renter assistance, to help people until the government money kicked in. So you know, we, have, we evolved and had a plan. So the next year at our annual investor meeting, 2021, we said, okay, next slide, Jeremy. Okay, so what did we learn from the pandemic? And I, I referred to Rocky, and Rocky's famous quote was, you, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. That pretty much summed up our, our pandemic and our COVID year. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. In other words, it's not about how hard you hit but it's how hard you can get hit. It's not about how good your company was doing, it's how well are you prepared to take a hit and keep moving forward. And, and he said, and that's how winning is done. And so we felt our plan, uh, we actually had our best year ever in 2020, even though we did not raise rent on our existing residents because of COVID, but there was so much demand as people moved to a cheaper alternative in housing, our occupancy went up, our rent collections were actually higher than they were pre-COVID, uh, it, it just worked. And so we had our best year in 2020. 2021, we had our second best year. So then we move into 2022, our annual investor meeting this year, Jeremy, the next slide. And our theme was, <laughs> everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. That was Mike Tyson's famous quote. And so we look at the punches we've had in the mouth you know, in the last year or so, it was the pandemic, politics, elections, supply chain, war, inflation, interest rates, you know, the punches in the mouth just keep coming, but, you know, we think we have a plan to, to keep moving forward. So the next slide shows how our, our funds have done uh, over the last you know, couple of years since inception. I, I won't go through a lot of detail on these as we get time to close out here. But basically, fund one uh, was a $15.4 million fund. We've already turned $22 million to investors, uh, and we have $10 million of remaining value and the equity we have left. Uh, we actually have a property in, in, in Arizona we have in a contract It's closing in two weeks. Uh, we paid $58 million for it. Our goal was to sell it for um, about $82 million. 
uh, we have it under contract for 105 million. So we're gonna kind of just wipe that return right off the chart for that one fund. So basically on a $15.4 million fund, I'm getting $13 million back from that. We have a joint venture partner with the Crow family in that deal. Uh, fund two is doing extraordinary. We uh, raised 48.6 million. We've already turned 72.9 million to investors. Uh, we still have 37.9 of equity uh, market value in that, uh, in that fund. Fund three, which we started prior to COVID and closed out last year, uh, we've sold one property out of that fund. It did a 61% IR return on that one sell. Uh, we have 98 million of equity remaining in that fund uh, and 111 million is the value. That doesn't include the three products we bought last year. They haven't been marked to market. And then fund four, for those of y'all that invest, you're gonna be real pleased. The returns you're gonna be seeing there. We've invested about 297 million. We actually have all the money placed with some deals we're closing this year, but we think we've picked up about 105 to 110 million of equity already in that fund on a very conservative basis. We have one property that we purchased in Gonzales, Louisiana. Uh, the property across the street, which is an inferior property, just traded for $100,000 million, $100, more per door than our property which is newer and a better property. So literally that property that we bought in April of last year, uh, we now have picked up at least a hundred. So that'd be about $30 million of value on one property uh, in, in one year in fund four. So uh, how well have we done? I mentioned our best years in 2020, we distributed, next slide, Jeremy. Uh, in 2020, we distributed 28 million to investors. Uh, in 2021, it was up to 52 million. Uh, year to date in 2022, we've distributed 10 million and we think we're going to distribute about 125 million to investors uh, this coming year. So here are our projections from our 2021 annual meeting. Um, and this is what we told people last year we thought was going to happen. We thought the, the development would continue to be robust. Uh, 325,000 units were delivered in 2021, so we were right there. We thought absorption would be about two to 250,000 units above net. So we thought there'd be about 450,000 units absorbed, maybe 500,000. We actually absorbed 617,000 across the industry. That is a record 58% higher than the previous record. Um, and again, that's why we're in this high occupancy. We thought the supply demand imbalance would continue. Occupancy is now over, we thought it'd be over 96% by this year. We're at 97.6%, so we're, uh, we, we missed that one in a good way. Um, rent increases, we thought we're gonna slow back down to about three to four, 4% in most markets and class A seeing about eight to 10%. Rent growth in 2021 was 19.8%. Um, for 2022, we thought rent increases would, you know, pick back up to about four and a half to five and a half percent in class A properties, or I'm sorry, settle down to four and a half to five and a half percent class A properties. And this year alone, we're seeing 10% increases across all property classes. So, so what do we think is going to happen for uh, the next uh, 2022 to 2024? Our projection, projections, we don't mind going out on a limb. Uh, next slide, I'm sorry, you missed those slides. Jeremy. Next slide, Jeremy. Um, we think development or supply will continue at about 425,000. That's 370 net in 2022 and stay around that number for the next couple of years. We think absorption is going to be about 425 and then decline slightly as people kind of settle in as their moves happen. Uh, we think occupancy will be at 97% through 2024. There's just not the supply coming on to meet the demand. Uh, we think rent growth uh, is going to recede from its current 10% uh, across all classes down to about 7% in 2023 and back to 4% in 2024. However, we think rent growth in class A properties uh, we'll continue to remain strong through 2024 and lead the pack. So, uh, so just real quickly, I want to touch base on what we're going to be looking for in our fifth fund. Uh, we call it Multifamily Strategic Investors Fund 5. And we call it strategic uh, in the sense that, I'm sorry, next slide, Jeremy. Um, it's a strategic fund because what our investors are telling us and what we believe, we're looking for long-term intrinsic value in properties. That is properties that have a good value today, but we believe will maintain and grow stronger in their value into the future. And so we're mainly looking for the, you know, the, 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 the property that we can hold for a long time. So strategic, in essence, means a longer-term fund. Or so in other words, we want our investors want to stay in the market over a longer period of time as opposed to our earlier funds, we were actually timing the market of getting in and out. 
Next slide, Jeremy. This is just important disclosure. I'm not raising money. I'm just telling you what we're thinking about for the fund. Next slide. So we think the opportunity is there's a shortage of housing stock, there's rising home prices, and a shifting population. And these are driving the, the basic multifamily fundamentals very positive. And we think those will continue for a number of years. Um, we think these fundamentals will create strong renter demand, especially in core value add and ground up development. Um, so our strategy is a growth strategy uh, based on identifying through the research and analysis that some of y'all have seen what we use and how we do it. Uh, those assets and markets that are likely to experience significant are above average appreciation uh, and value. Um, this fund is also a little unusual for most real estate funds. You'll see that we're going to actually have three classes of assets in it, uh, core plus value add and ground up development. Most funds just pick one of those to invest in, but we want to be able to pivot within the fund as we see opportunities to create the best returns for our investors. Um, because it's strategic, this fund will be more eight to 10 years in nature. Uh, we've talked about uh, the housing market and uh, the targeted returns. We'll talk about those in a second as well. So the next slide, Jeremy. So this is why we're picking on those three. We're looking to achieve a 12 to 15% net IRR to investors in this fund. The core properties just do not meet that. Core Plus, which, which those of you that aren't familiar with it, so Core Plus are the best properties in secondary markets, are the best properties in secondary locations in primary markets. So for instance, in Houston, Texas, where I'm from, River Oaks is a primary core type market. I-10 Corridor is a Core Plus market. And the reason for that is it's a great city, i.e. Houston, but it's in a secondary location along I-10. So it's, it's newer properties and uh, in, in, in markets like that. Um, ground up development is exactly what it says. We are not developers. I, 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 I do not wanna say that too loud or too, I can't say it too loud. We are not developers, but we're the equity behind the developers. One of the things that happened during fund four, which some of y'all that were participating in fund four remember that it was a fund that identified distressed sellers, not distressed properties. And we bailed a lot of developers out of some very difficult situations. And they remembered us. And now they've come back to us and said, would you guys like to be my partner on some of these deals going forward? And the numbers we're looking at, there's a spread of about $75,000 to $100,000 per unit based on what it costs us to build versus what the retail value is when those properties are stabilized. And then we think there's going to be some opportunity in the value add space. Right now, people are overpaying for value add properties. And we th and, and the reason for that, rents have moved up so much, um, you know, Teachers, doctors, I'm sorry, teachers, nurses, firemen, policemen, they have a limit in terms of how much they can pay as rent. They're not supposed to go past 33% of their income, and they're already at that. So it's really hard to go in and put a new appliance package, put in a new pool and all these things and charge $400 more a month when they're already at their maximum rent. So, But we think the people that are overpaying for these properties, those deals are going to come back to us at a reduced price where we can actually do something on those value adds. So there you can see the targeted returns of the fund. And then finally, um, these are the proposed terms for the fund. In this presentation, next slide, please, Jeremy. So uh, we're basically looking at a, a targeted net of 12 to 15%, preferred return of eight, uh, targeted yield of seven to nine after stabilization. It takes about you know, two years to stabilize new development. Um, targeted multiple return is two to three X. Fund life, about eight to 10 years. Investment period, 24 months. Minimum investment is a million dollars. We work with our existing investors, or if you uh, would like to talk to us about doing something at a lower level, we can do that. Uh, and there's our fees and carried interest. So that's really uh, what we have for today. I hope it's been educational and, uh, and helpful. Jeremy, any questions that have come up or anything we can answer in the next few minutes? Or uh, Yes, I think everyone can hear me. You've got quite a bit, um, but let's see. We have only about four minutes. So one question was about um, the housing shortage. Is this because private equity firms like Blackstone bought a lot of single family after the Great Recession? Has that tightened supply? That's one question. It, it did, but the supply opened back up. Uh, they didn't buy that many back then. There wasn't that much money. Blackstone wasn't chasing that much back then. There were some funds, but uh, it's just a shortage of construction. It's, it, it's, you know, it's, there's no one thing. That's why I call it a slow creep to crisis. There's no one event that happened. It's just been a, a lot going on during that period of time. Another question. Um, <clears throat> someone's a bit confused, but bear their ignorance. What is the total supply versus total demand? I'm hearing that there's less inventory available in single family space. But my understanding is that more went into the hands of Wall Street. 
That could be, um, but I, uh, 33% of all homes bought this year are by cash buyers, i.e. Wall Street and people like that. So you, know, you can draw your own conclusion. Uh, what are you underwriting on cap rates? Are you underwriting rising cap rates? <laughs> we think cap rates are kind of you know, overstated uh, because values move so much. Uh, what I can tell you, when we underwrite a property, we always add 50 to 75 basis points to the cap rate for our exits. Um, but, you know, cap rates vary. You know, if you look at some of the cap rates on the fund four properties we bought, you'd probably go, what are you guys thinking? Well, what we want, you know, we knew rents would go up. And, you know, some of those rents went up by 30 something percent last year. So now we look like heroes. So it's just understanding the market. It's not just about cap rates anymore. Okay, two minutes. Is it possible that all the PE money chasing single family rentals may be the new Noni driving resi values into a bubble? No, I, I, I don't. I don't believe in the, the, the bubble theory. Um, we have never been in a recessionary shadow with such low amounts of supply. Uh, I, I think there may be a bubble in some of the higher price properties, but you know, anything that comes up that's for sale for 350 to 400,000 is, is going to be bought in a couple of days. It's just, just you know, it's, it just is what it is. So, and I, I think, you know, there is a huge demand for single family rentals by residents. As long as that demand is there, there's going to be money raised in that sector. I think the real difficulty in that sector are the people that stray beyond their geographic boundaries uh, because servicing single, say, I, I, if I have 300 apartments, there are 300 residents living in 300 units. I'm on 20 something acres. I've got a couple of handyman. I've got, uh, you know, supply guys. I can fix anything. If I've got 300 apartments scattered throughout Clearwater, St. Pete, I might can visit three, maybe four of those a day. I, that, that's it. So that, that's the challenge in that industry. Last one is how do you define an actual starter home? The starter home is a home that's affordable to somebody making the median income in the United States, which is about sixty-two dollars to $63,000 a year. So that would mean a starter home would be about two hundred, dollars uh, about $325,000, $350,000. If you do the math, you put 20% down, you qualify for a loan at X percent, that's what you can buy. That's a starter home, and those are just not available right now. Is that it? That's it. Thank, Thank you. Thank so you all much. very much. It's been great talking to you all. Uh, this will be posted. If you have any questions, my contact information is there. Be uh, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you all very much. Michael, thank you guys at Fly. You guys are always great. Appreciate the time. I'm going to Ernest, thank you very much for your time.